All right. Well, here we are. We are now live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter on KGRADB Radio and Rumble. And hello to all you guys listening to us on uh, Spreaker. Hello to you guys watching us on Twitter or X. And hello to you guys watching us on TikTok. So I think we've covered it all. <laughs> I, think we, I think we pretty much got almost every uh, social media outlet there is, except for a few others. We, we uh, try to, to air. It's like, yeah. Well, tonight we have a really cool show, but before we do this, you know that I always have to tell you guys about a really great, great site. And of course, they are our producers for the show, so we appreciate them very, very much. And I want you to go to this website, and I want you to show your love and support to them. And it's kgradb.com, K-G-R-A-D as in dog, B as in bicycle.com. They have some really, really cool shows there. And... Uh, Make sure you subscribe and but put Bishop as your promo code because you're going to get 30% off your subscription. It's already affordable as it is. But if you love the paranormal like I do, you, you, you got to subscribe. They have really, really great shows there. And uh, I'm honored to be uh, one of the uh, shows that they air. So, and matter of fact, we're live right now on KGRADB Radio. So make sure, make sure you head over to KGRADB.com. Okay, KGRADB.com. And uh, there we go. But put Bishop as your promo code. Well, you can still be a ghost in, uh, a hunt, uh, investigator and, and be a Christian. I am an investigator and I'm a Christian. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Now, I, if you want to go to my website, it's bishopjameslong.com. Very simple. Bishopjameslong, L-O-N-G dot com. Bishopjameslong.com. If you want to go to the church's website, that's easy too. U-S-O-C-C dot org. All right. So... Yeah, folks, right now, today is Paranormal Fridays. So we, we, we're we here Sundays and Wednesdays for Bible study. We're here for about three, four hours sometimes. Uh, on Saturdays, we're here. Uh, we do Bible questions then. Today is Bible study. I'm sorry, today is Paranormal Fridays. People wait an entire week for this. I don't really talk a whole lot paranormal during the week because I'm very strict on when it's Sundays and Wednesdays. For those of you who want to know the schedule, Sundays and Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I do Bible study. I am very strict about keeping paranormal separate from scripture and Bible study. I don't entertain the two at all. So uh, Sundays and Wednesdays, that's it. Now, of course, Paranormal Fridays is tonight, Fridays. And then Saturdays is open mic, or we can talk about anything. Doesn't matter. If you want to talk about paranormal, that's cool. If you want to talk about uh, supernatural or, if you're, or uh, whatever you want to talk about, theology, we can certainly do that tomorrow. It's open mic night. But tonight is Paranormal Night. Okay. So let me let me address that one one uh, statement uh, that someone says. Well, I am a I'm a Christian. I, I'm a, I'm a former paranormal investigator. I think the person said, and then I'm a Christian. Uh, I said, well, I, I don't want to put words in your. Let me just double check just to make sure because when I, I looked at the the text and I saw that, I thought, hmm, that doesn't make sense. Um, former ghost hunter and now a Christian. Well, let me just say something about that because it's very important. Um. And, and that's okay that you're a former. I, I never, I never really liked the term ghost hunter. I, I've always had a problem with that. I'm, what are you hunting? You're hunting, you're hunting Bambi. I said to me, I've never, I've never liked it. I've never liked that term hunter. I just, and, and it's not because I have a problem with hunting. I used to teach kids um, in uh, with the Kentucky Department, you know, Department of Fish and Wildlife. So it, it's not because I have no issues with hunting. It's just, I, I just, uh, I, that's always kind of set bad with me. But let me just say that very quickly. There's a lot of people that like to throw, uh, and I'm not saying you are, So, but there's a lot of people who like to throw stones and say, well, you can't be a Christian and be a paranormal investigator. That is absolutely 1 million percent untrue, 100% untrue. And I'm telling you as clergy, I've devoted my entire life to the study of theology. And as a paranormal investigator myself, I love the paranormal. I love the paranormal community. And I refuse to, uh, I just absolutely firmly reject the notion that you cannot be a Christian and be a paranormal investigator. And I'll tell you why. Uh, there are so many people that have contacted me through the years, thousands, thousands. I have now 15,000 messages on TikTok. I have, I don't know how many messages on email. People through the years have asked me to come to their home uh, to investigate it, to bless it, or they think they're possessed. Now, let me just, let me just say something very clearly. I cannot be at two places at once. And I do not have my private plane yet, but I have, I did play the, the lottery and I spent $2 and I lost. Okay. But here's the deal. If it weren't for paranormal investigators, I couldn't do my ministry. Now, that's the God's honest truth. 
because I, I, this is why 20 years ago I started the paranormal clergy, which I gave that away to Rich Valdez because that, that, that was the point to build it up, to give it to laity so they could run it. The paranormal clergy, the whole point of that was to build a network of paranormal teams that don't think everything is a demon, that actually are professionals. And when I have a case in Washington or New York or California or Florida or Texas, I can't get to all these places. It's impossible. So I have I had a network of paranormal investigators who were ex, who were Christians, who were loving, who were kind, and these are the individuals that said, "Yep, Bishop, I'll 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 drive two or three hours to this place, I'll investigate for you, and I'll give you all the evidence, and then you can determine what you want to do from there." They never charge the client once. They never ask for gas money. They never ask for reimbursement. And they're the ones picking up the phone for me when I'm two or three o'clock in the morning when someone's calling me and they're terrified. So I call a paranormal team. I say, I need your help. No problem, Bishop. We'll be out there tomorrow morning. And then they get and then they pack up all their equipment, which, by the way, the equipment is very expensive. The equipment is not cheap. And they go to these people's homes whom they don't even know. They don't owe these people anything. They don't owe them nothing, not one thing. But yet they're willing to pack up their entire car, all their equipment, and take their, their team to this home to this where people are terrified to investigate, to determine if there's anything going on. And try hopefully to debunk it. That's the goal is let's try to debunk the activity. But there are times where you can't debunk it, where it is theological. And so they gather all the evidence, which, by the way, that takes a tremendous amount of time. If you're a paranormal investigator, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, when you, if you have uh, six hours of investigation, you have to investigate all the film, all the audio, everything, everything. That's a tremendous amount of dedication and time. And they do this and they do it every time and they never charge not one penny. Folks, if that's not a ministry, I don't know what is. That is the very essence. That's the very definition of ministry. So these people, these paranormal investigators who I know and who I love and I respect, they go out, they go to these homes, sometimes traveling three or four hours to these people's homes. And again, not charging one dime for their time or reimbursement. They spend hours investigating, hours gathering the evidence. They present all of it to me and they say, this is our finding. So for anybody, so anybody and, I'm, and again, I'm not saying this is for a specific person because there's a lot of people out there who judge paranormal investigators. So this is for those people who like to judge paranormal investigators and say paranormal investigators are doing the work of the de of devil. I don't see you picking up the phone at two or three o'clock in the morning. I don't see you going out and, and buying thousands of dollars worth of equipment. I don't see you saying, yep, we'll go to this family's the house that we don't even know and travel all these hours to get there, spend hours at the location, review all the evidence, and then contact clergy and say, this is what we found and never charge one dime. I don't see you doing that. What I do see you is you opening your mouth and offering complaints and offering uh, issues about judgment. If anybody is being a Christian, it's those people who gather their, their equipment, who gather the team, those individuals are being the Christians. It's not Christianity to sit and judge teams who go out and investigate and bust their asses to help families who are going through extreme. That's, you see, anybody can judge somebody. Anybody can do that. That's not being, that's not being Christian. So the, if in my definition, a Christian is exactly what the paranormal teams go out and do every day, all the time. And again, not one time do they ask for money. Not one time. So that is, uh, this is why I, I, I stand up firmly, firmly, and I don't give a damn what anybody says. I firmly stand up and support paranormal investigators who are going out there every day and helping clergy uh, to determine what's going on in people's homes. They should be, you know what? Those people are the paranormal celebrities. Those individuals are the paranormal celebrities. See, anybody can look in a camera and say, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Anybody can do that. A clown can do that. That doesn't make you a paranormal celebrity. It makes you an entertainer. The people who are paranormal celebrities are the people who are getting in their car and traveling to people's homes and helping them. 
Those are the individuals that should be applauded. Those are the individuals that should be giving the autographs at the paranormal conferences. Not a person who looks in front of a camera and say, did you hear that? So for any of you out there, any of you, if you're a paranormal investigator and you have helped clergy, I applaud you. And I sincerely, with all of my heart, I am so grateful that you and your team have generously given your time, your money, your effort into helping people whom you don't even know and you don't owe them a thing. And the fact that you do this day in and day out, let me tell you this, you are the paranormal celebrities and I personally 100% support each of you and thank God for you. Thank God, because you're doing a beautiful ministry, a beautiful ministry. And um, I, I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how many parent, how many, how, how many people I have helped through the years, over two decades now, because a paranormal team answered the call to go to someone's home and investigate. And because it was for them, I was able to gather all the evidence and say, yep, something is going on. This family needs immediate attention. I raise money. I raise funds to get to the family because I don't charge either. Never have in 20 years, never will. So I go to families' homes, bless their homes. God forbid if there's an exorcism, never have I ever charged one dime, not one dime to go to someone's home to bless their home or performing an exorcism. Never, ever, never will I. And it's interesting because I get a lot of cases, but I, I'll tell you this. I have learned something in life, especially in the paranormal investigating team as far as clergy. Every time there was a legitimate demonic case, God found a way for me to get to that person's home. And that, that could be either through you know me fundraising and busting my tail to fundraise, or it could be that someone helped me. And you know who you are. You know who you are. Okay, uh, for those of you who, uh, who are just tuning in, Okay, you're probably thinking, what, what, who made Bishop Long that? Nobody, nobody. I just, I, I support my paranormal, uh, paranormal community. Next week, we are not, I am not going to be live here in the studio. But if everything works out, which we're working on things, right now the plan is for me to be live at a particular location. And I will be on scene right there. And we will be streaming live everywhere, just as we're doing now. Right now with this live show, we'll be streaming live everywhere. I'm going to be at Ashmore Estates. And um, so let's talk a little bit about this. And then we're going to get uh, bring the owner in. We're going to bring the owner in and uh, chat with him. And he's going to tell you a little bit about uh, Ashmore Estates. From 1857 to 1869, the Coles County Poor Farm was located near the small town of Loxa. But in 1870, the county purchased land in Ashmore Township for a new farm, placing it alongside the Indianapolis and St. Louis Railroad. Now, the first uh, almshouse building located on the property housed both the poor and insane and soon fell in deplorable condition. And it was unsafe and unsanitary. And in 1911, it was condemned by the State Board of Charities. Now, many of the residents passed away during the uh, first almshouse years of operations and were buried in a graveyard on the north side of the property. So a new almshouse was built in 1916 and operated there for many years, bringing hope to the destitute and allowing many to work for their bed and board and farming and caring for the livestock on the county land. Now, Ashmore Estates, as it was called, was finally sold by the county in 1959 and was opened as a private psychiatric facility. Can you imagine the trauma there? And in 18, uh, I'm sorry, in October 1964, only five years in operation, the psychiatric hospital closed down because of debt. The institution reopened in 1965, but changed its focus from a private facility to one that accepted patients from mental, uh, in, in state mental institutions. Now, the hospital became overcrowded and there was a need for more space and a new wing but money would not be appropriated for construction until 1977. Now, work was not completed until the 1980s, and by that time, it was too late. Uh, due to money shortages and problems with licensing, the Illinois uh, Health Facility Planning Board closed the facility. And by April 8, 1986, the inmates had been transferred to other hospitals, uh, and Ashmore State's closed its doors. Patients, I should say. Well, three years later, 
an attempt was made open um, to, to open Ashmore States, again, as a mental health facility for teenage boys. But the Ashmore Village Board denied the request due to fire safety issues and public opposition. So in 1988, uh, Sullivan, Illinois man purchased the property to remodel into a home, but continuous vandalism and break-ins forced him to abandon the plan. So finally, in 2006, the former asylum was purchased by a private owner, but unfortunately, tornado damage, I remember that, and other setbacks forced the sale of the building to a new owner who has also opened it up for paranormal investigations. So let's talk about now the hauntings. This is it one of the most paranormal, one of those haunted locations in the United States? And after it was the first abandoned in 1987, Ashmore Estates became a local curiosity and a favorite place for area teenagers to break into and vandalize. Rumors spread that the building was haunted and many wondered inside in hopes of encountering a ghost. Some of the confusion about the ghost stories came from a fictional story that was written about the old building and the ghost of a girl who passed in a fire in the Alms House. Now, unfortunately, many have come to believe the story is true. And while this was only a fictional ghost story, there are many who claim that the old building really is haunted. And there have been a variety of paranormal events reported at the farm, uh, former Alms House and Asylum, from apparitions to phantom footsteps and unexplainable sounds. For this reason, visitors have come to believe that many of the former inmates of the place have never actually left. So we're going to find out tonight if Ashmore Estates is really as haunted as so many people claim. And perhaps, perhaps maybe next week when I go live on scene in Ashmore Estates, maybe we'll be able to uh, show some evidence that we've captured. But tonight we're going to talk to uh, an individual that I have uh, met many, many years ago, and he is the owner of uh, Ashmore Estates. Well, hello there and how are you? And welcome to the presentation. Hey, thanks for having me on. I sure appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you could just let everybody know, just tell them your name and uh, a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name is Robin Terry. And as you mentioned, I, I own Ashmore States. I, uh, I purchased the building back in May of 2014. So it'll be 10 years now. Um, I It's kind of a hobby of mine. It's not like a full-time job or anything. And anybody who thinks you're making a lot of money owning venues is really, really wrong. But, uh, but yeah, I have a, I actually am an insurance agent. I own an insurance agency that we've, uh, we specialize in collector car insurance all over the country. I live in another haunted location. Um, it's the, uh, a theater in Auburn, Illinois that's been haunted and, uh, it has a very strange haunting involved with that thing from the last few years. But, uh, but yeah, we built a house inside the, the theater and we live there and, uh, it's about two hours away from, from Ashmore, which I'm actually out here at the property tonight. So we've got the, some events going on this weekend and all. And uh, so I came out here and, and just kind of scampered out here from the office so we could get out here in time and talk to you. Well, and I appreciate you doing that. That, that was very nice. And, and, of course, next week we'll talk about that because I, uh, you know, I'm really, really looking forward to what happens next week. Um, uh, because, you know, we have an investigation that I was asked to attend. And I'm excited about it. So we talked a little, a little bit of history on uh, Ashmore Estates as far as when it was first established. I mean, back in 1857 to 1869, I mean, in, in, in 1870, it seems like it has a lot of history there, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, it was, uh, every, every, every county in the state had to have an almshouse or as we called them back then as a poor farm. And I always tell people when they come here, it's like, you know, this is that your parents used to tell you, your grandparents or great grandparents would tell you that if you don't stop it, you're going to send me to the poor farm. That's where we're at. And this is what it was. It was a place where people went that didn't have money, didn't have any place to live. They may have actually been like uh, sentenced to come here from the court system, basically because they may have had a, uh, you know, some type of record or they could have been anything from serial killers to rapists. So it was, you know, there was you know, abundance of different people that lived here. Wow. Wow. So that's, and I, I think when you, when you listen to, uh, when you read the, the, the background, and you understand there is so much, there had to be so much energy there. And so, but let me ask you, before we get into the real uh, interesting questions, what made you decide to buy it? That's, that's kind of funny in itself because I actually came out here, I think it was in 2012 or 2011. I came out here because I do investigations myself. I've been an investigator for about 20 years. And so I was out here to investigate the building and it was with a tour group and they had so many people 
that you couldn't, you had no idea. I mean, you were, the people were everywhere. And at that time, it was a haunted house set up. And so there was like six or eight of us in one area. We didn't even know each other were in the area because they had, you know, fake walls and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I finally got tired. I'm like, I'm out of here. So I left and, and drove back home. And, and then uh, we used to run a haunted house ourselves in the theater at our building for a uh, charitable organization and so we did that for 10 years and they were selling some props out here because scott kelly who owned the place at the time was going to close it close it down so i came out and bought some props i thought you know i really like this building this just got a cool vibe to it so a few years later i had a guy call me when we were selling all of our props because we decided to get out of the haunted house business and a guy called me and goes, hey, he said, I understand you're selling all your props. I'm interested in buying a bunch of them if you don't mind. And I went, yeah, come on over. We'll take a look. So he came over and looked at everything, and he picked out a ton of stuff we had. And I asked him, I said, you know, he I told him, I said, I, you know, I live here. This is where my house is. So, you know, no problem coming over here on a weekday or weekend. It's not a problem. And, and so he asked me, he's like, this is kind of cool working and living in a haunted house in a, in a movie theater. He said, so any chance you take me for a walkthrough of the place? And I said, sure, we'll do it. So we're walking through and he mentioned, he said, uh, we're upstairs. And I said, so where are you building this haunt? He said, well, I have one right now. He said, but I'm closing it down because I'm going to build one in Indiana because Illinois changed their laws. Hmm. And I'm like, where is it? He said, Ashmore States. I'm like, oh, some of the props you bought came from Ashmore States. And uh, so we started talking about it. I said, what are you going to do with it? He said, I'm going to sell it. And my wife sitting in the chair at the other side of the room going, oh, no, because you heard me talk about the place before, how much I enjoyed the building and everything. So I said, I'd really like to come out and look at that place. So we came out on a, it was actually the weekend before, I think it was the weekend of Easter Sunday or the weekend before, and walked through the building. And there was something about the building and something when I walked through the second floor, and I'm as sensitive as a rock. I mean, I had no you know, n- no psychic abilities whatsoever. I don't, I'm on an empath. I don't get those feelings like a lot of people do, but there was something on that second floor that just said, help our building. And hmm. the theater that I bought was in bad shape. And I redid that and, you know, made that a, a livable structure. And there was, there was just something there that said, help our building. And so, you know, on my way home, my wife says, well, you might as well buy it. And I'm like, oh yeah. She said, yeah, cause you're going to anyway. So you might as well just do it. So, so we bought it bought it and closed on it i think it was may 3rd or may 4th of 2014 so it's coming up on 10 years and came over and what was amazing is the paranormal community when i bought it i came out front took a picture of the building and put it on facebook and said the only thing cooler owning one haunted location is owning two and uh and my phone blew up people asked me all kinds of stuff about i can't believe you bought ashmore states and and they said yep yeah we decided to go ahead and do it and uh, so we bought it and Everybody came out. We had all kinds of people wanted to help us clean it up. And I, I'm kind of different. When I bought the building, it was not, I mean, there was, it was strange because there was no roof, no yeah. windows, no electricity, no water. The grass was three feet high. I mean, there was really no reason to buy it. But there was just that thing that just told me that I need to have this. And I reached out to the paranormal community and just told them we were doing this. And they, a lot of them wanted to come out and help. So we organized work days and came out. And I wouldn't let anybody investigate the building, really, until we got it cleaned up where I felt it was safe that people could come through it. And so that's what we did. And that's how I basically ended up with it. Uh, for those of you just tuning, out, tuning in, we are talking to uh, one of the owners. Uh, his, he and his wife owns uh, the Ashmore Estates. Uh, it's a uh, haunted location. It's a haunted building that uh, is, is pretty well known within the United States. Uh, a lot of other places actually know. A lot of other countries even know about this. It's um, There's a lot of, we'll talk about the uh, the some of the, the television shows that have been there as well and their findings. So uh, hopefully, hopefully next week, uh, we are planning on uh, airing the show live from Ashmore Estates next week. Now, that's why I wanted to do this show tonight to introduce Ashmore Estates to those of you who don't know much about it. And of course, the owner and then get you excited because this is the, um, it's going to be very cool because next week there's actually going to be an investigation occurring. And so people are going to be investigating uh, Ashmore while we are live. And hopefully they'll be able to come down and say, I, you know, I found this or I saw this or I experienced this. And we'll put them on camera so you guys can see them. So we're really, really looking forward to this. Uh, and hopefully you guys are as well. I'm sure you are. Now, so yeah, uh, uh, Robin, uh, Terry, Robin and Norman Terry, uh, they are the owners of Ashmore. Ashmore Estates is located in Ashmore, Illinois. 
for those of you who are wanting to know a little bit about this. And I remember, I remember, of course, I, I've been in the paranormal community for a long, long, long time, long time. And uh, my first paranormal investigation was 35 years ago. And so publicly, I went public with my ministry over uh, 24 years, gosh, 24 years ago. And uh, I remember when Ashmore was hit uh, with, uh, with a tornado, did a lot of damage. Man, it did a lot of damage. But let me ask you there, Robin, how did uh, Ashmore Estates, from your perspective, your knowledge, become known as a haunted location? I think with that, a lot of it, basically because some people came out and started investigating it and just had some strange experiences, couldn't explain it. And some of the people that were working the haunted house at the time had some of those same experiences and they just, they didn't understand it. The owners at the time had a haunted house in there, but he, he was because of his, uh, he was a Mormon and he just not, he didn't believe in it. I mean, he just mm -hmm. didn't believe in the paranormal whatsoever and really didn't want a lot to do with it. So, but there was a, enough interest and people wanted to come out here and wanted to experience it. And so that's what they started doing. And they came out a lot more and, it just kind of, you know, it was it was open to the paranormal, but it really wasn't. It, it they weren't pushing it, so to speak. Yeah. They were, if you want to come out and investigate, that's fine. But we don't believe there's anything here that you can do it. Is kind of their attitude they had. But it was, uh, but yeah, it, it just took off over the years. Yet you know, there's a lot more people that wanted to investigate it. But I think a lot of it too was that it wasn't as popular back then because the condition of the building ah, and nobody yeah. wanted to come out here in a building that was falling apart from, you know, the water coming through the ceiling, through the roof and everything, because there was no water, you know, there was no windows. So there was birds flying in and out, you know, and, and all over the place. So mm -hmm. it was kind of tough, but we fought people out here just because they were interested in paranormal. And then there was a lot of experiences. Now, for those of you, if you're wanting to to be there live next week, you can't. I, I think there are tickets still available. I have not. I've not been informed uh, one way or the other. But uh, if you want, go to theurbaninvestigator.com. That's the website, theurbaninvestigator.com. And if you click on events, you will see uh, Friday, April the nineteenth, two thousand twenty-four, and a book now. Uh, so that's where you can. I'm just clicking it as I, as I'm telling you now. And there it is. So it, I, it's going to be a seven hour event. And uh, this uh, individual uh, is pretty much in, in, char in charge of it. Uh, his name, uh, of course, of course, not him, but it's Vince uh, Kelly and I believe. But it's at the uh, click on events. So just type in the urban investigator dot com. Click on events and you'll see right there. Ashmore Estates. Scroll down. Book now. And then, of course, you can join us. That would be really cool to have you. Really, really cool to have you. Uh, that, that I think that would be pretty fascinating. I'm looking forward to it. Truly am. Now, so let me ask you then, uh, since you've owned the building, can you describe some of the reported paranormal activities at Ashmore States that you believe are legit? Well, I'll tell you the ones that I've had. And okay. I know those because they were personal experiences of mine. Yeah. But in uh, May of 14, I, when I bought the building, we were we were down there in the boiler room area. And a girl and I were down there cleaning the place up. This is the middle of the afternoon. We're down there cleaning everything up. And as we're walking out, you know, if you, you know how you step on a shoelace and your foot stops. Mm -hmm. And I, I told her, I said, Hey, I said, let me tie my shoelace before we go up these stairs. I said, no, I don't fall. And uh, so I looked down and I'm like, my shoelaces are tied. And then something just stopped my foot from moving. And uh, it was like, it, I didn't feel a hand grab it, but I felt it stop. It was like, you know, just stop in mid stride. It was like, didn't want me to move any further. So that was one that I had down there. I had another experience a, a week or two later upstairs in the third floor where we had, uh, I was hooking up electrical and there was something up there. And like I said earlier, I'm, I'm not sensitive at all, but there was something that was telling me to get out of the building. Oh. And it was just kept getting stronger and stronger, that feeling. And, and I kind of explained it like if you go to a party and you're looking around and you're like, I probably shouldn't be here because you had that feeling that like nobody really wanted you there. And that's the feeling I had. And I, I actually told the spirits in the bill, I'm like, okay, if you guys are having a party and I'm not invited, that's fine. I'll leave, but I'm coming back tomorrow just so you'll know. And uh, so I took off and uh, and left and went out and picked up some supplies and came back. But there, there's probably my, my most credible person that's ever given me information about the building is from a, a nine-year-old girl that lived down the street. 
she was she lived about roughly two to three blocks down the street and she would tell her mom that her friend from Ashmore was visiting her and they would sit in there and sing songs and things like that. She told her that the girl, she described the girl to her. So I asked her mom, I said, ask her what she looks like. And she told her she had like a white ruffled dress on and she had hair ribbons in her hair. Well, girls today don't wear hair ribbons. So that, I mean, that was something that she picked up on that would have happened back when, you know, when girls were that age back, you know, years ago. And she picked up on that. She also picked up on, she said that this little girl that her friend that came down to visit her, her mom had a candle on the counter one day and she came out and blew the candle. I was like, no, you can't do that. And she's like, why? She said, because my friend got hurt by a candle and you can't do that. Hmm. Well, that's the story of Elba Skinner. You know, with, she got her dress caught fire and that's how she got hurt. And oh, she wow. basically died from those injuries from the fire in the original building, not this one, but the original buildings, but right on the same grounds where this one was built. So, and she had, she's had a few other stories too that she tell us throughout there. The ones she told us at Christmas time, we were putting, we put lights up inside the building and outside the building and they were out of town that weekend. Her mom called me on Monday say, did you guys put lights up for the weekend? I'm like, yeah. And she said, because Autumn said that she, her friend came down and told her that she likes it now that you guys put the lights up in the building because she can see better at night. And mm. she had no idea we put these Christmas lights up. So she was told by the little girl in the building, we put Christmas lights up. So That's you know, to me, that nine-year-old girl is probably the best you know, the best informant that I've had as far as the building because she wouldn't, she's not going to lie about stuff. She doesn't know how to do that. Wow. And, you know, and for those of you who just, yeah, we will be airing this live next week. Uh, and so everybody can watch it. So it'll, it'll be streamed just like we're doing this, just like we do every Friday show. It'll be live for everybody. For those of you offering gifts to the ministry on TikTok, thank you so much for that. I apologize for not thanking you individually. Just I have three computers running at the same time. So, and I, I want to address this because I think this is very important. Uh, I truly do. Uh, there's uh, people always love to give an opinion based on what. Uh, and they always say, well, all hauntings are demonic. And then I always ask them, that, is that you're based on your opinion or is that based on the fact that you're a paranormal investigator and you can actually back it up with some type of evidence? Well, that's just my opinion. Okay, so let me just make this very clear. As someone who investigated thir 35 years ago was the first time that I've, I've ever investigated. And as clergy, I work demonic cases. As an exorcist, that's, this is what I do. And I'm telling you now, as an exorcist and as clergy and an investigator, I'm telling you not every case is demonic. It simply is not true. And I tell you that because I'm actually there. So I'm not giving you an opinion based on just reading books. I'm giving you an opinion based on the fact that I actually work the cases. So it, all these people who are constantly saying that everything is always demonic, you are absolutely 100% incorrect. Uh, anybody can give an opinion. And, and people say, well, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, there are no such thing as ghosts. The Bible says so. Actually, you're wrong. The Bible says just the opposite. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 26, when Jesus was walking on water, the disciples were terrified and they said, look, it is a ghost. Furthermore, when Luke chapter 24, verse 36 through 51, when Jesus was crucified, he came back and he showed them on the third day and they were terrified and they said, they, they thought it was a ghost. That's what it says in scripture. It doesn't say demon. Demon and ghost are two different words. Even in the Hebrew and Greek, two different, complete, totally different words. And then Jesus says, touch me and find out for yourselves. Ghosts do not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Now I talk about this and I say this all the time, but the trolls are always going to, always going to say something negative. If there were no such thing as a ghost, Jesus would have responded, don't be silly, there are no such things as a ghost. But that's not what he said. He actually clarified it. Ghosts do not have flesh and bones as you have, which obviously implies that ghosts are spirit form. So the idea that it is ghosts are uh, unbiblical, you're incorrect. But ghosts are actually very biblical. And I just gave you two examples where the disciples had the concept of what ghosts were. And it also tells you that Jesus clearly established that ghosts exist because if they didn't, he would have said they don't exist. Knock it off. So, and, and not everything is demonic uh, as everybody thinks it is, or not everybody, but there's a lot of people think everything is demonic and it's not, it simply isn't. So let me ask you, uh, are there any particular rooms or areas at Ashmore Estates that are known to be especially active? Because I'm going to really want to know that, especially for next week. Yeah, you know, 
when people come to the building and ask that question, which they, they ask it all the time, I always tell them that when you came on the property, you came to probably with some of the most active area because we don't know where it's going to be. There's certain areas I'll tell people, you know, the boiler room, the kitchen area, the children's women's children's dining hall, the second floor hallway, third floor hallway. You know, those like I always tell them, if you're going to be here for two or three hours, make sure you hit those spots. But as far as, you know, like, and I always kind of refer to it as like a, a, a crappie lake or something. There's not any spot where there might be like trees planted where the fish go to, just like the spirits here in the building. There's not a spot in the building where the spirits congregate and they're just waiting for somebody. It, it can happen anywhere and any time throughout the entire building. And we've had experiences in every room in the building. So it's kind of a, I always say it depends on the group there, the, mm -hmm. the energy in that group and what they're doing. Oh, very cool. And for those of you on TikTok, I'll, I'll leave the chat open for everybody. Uh, but obviously, if it gets to a point where the moderators can't enjoy it, we'll do sub chat only for this hour. But right now, we'll, we'll just keep it as it is. You know, there's a lot when you're dealing with a lot of uh, haunted locations. Many times there is a particular ghost story, if you will, that is associated with that particular location. And I mean, if you look at uh, I would certainly say uh, you know, at uh, Waverly Hills, a lot of people know that little little boy, Timmy, you know, who likes to play the ball and kick the ball. So are there any particular well-known ghosts, if you would, uh, that's associated with Ashmore? There's two that we talk about because we can prove these two. Okay. Yeah, I kind of one that I don't really get caught up in the folklore about things that if I can't prove it, it didn't happen as far as I'm concerned. So the, the one being Elva Skinner, which is the little girl that died in the previous building. Mm -hmm. But I think her ghost is still, you know, or her spirit of the bill is still inside the building and she still stays in the building. And because of the autumn, the girl down the street and others that have seen a little girl and had experiences in there. The other one is Joe Boxham, who actually did die in the building. He was hit by a train on his way back from Oakland, Illinois. He was walking back and got kind of clipped by a train oh. and some people brought him back here to the building and he died inside the building. And we think that his spirit is still there. He was kind of the um, kind of like the, the groundskeeper caretaker of the building. Mm -hmm. He was a, uh, you know, a lot of the people that are there were, were autistic or, you know, has some type of um, even during the poor farm days. You know, they may have been autistic or has some, some mental issues, and they gave him a job to do because they felt that giving somebody like that a job would help them out in, you know, in life. Yeah. And so he was kind of in charge of everything in the, the maintenance area. So in the boiler room area, in the maintenance area, he's pretty much headstrong that especially women should not be down there. And we get a lot of women that have a lot of experiences right there in this particular area. Now, I, I talked to a lot about uh, the paranormal, of course, investigations, also demonic and poltergeist activity. And I, I, I'm a firm believer. I've had poltergeist cases before and poltergeist for many people who don't know. Uh, poltergeist means noisy ghost. But from my perspective as an investigator, as clergy, I have found that it's not a, a, a ghost at all. It's actually negative energy that someone who is omitting because they're going through extreme emotional stress. I can perform uh, minor writer uh, exorcisms on many locations, a thousand of on a particular location, and it does nothing, nothing at all to a poltergeist activity. Because from my experience, it, it is the negative energy that someone is omitting. That's not, think of this, you're walking down the street, someone's walking towards you, and you don't know the person, but you know you don't want to know the person, so you go on the opposite side. That person is omitting the negative energy. It's just energy. Or a person can walk into a room, not say a word, and people flock to that person. It's positive energy. And I, that, I have found that when you give the person or you find the person uh, therapy or counseling, the activity will dramatically stop. But there's a lot of people who, in my opinion, get poltergeist activity confused with haunting. But again, it's, that's a debatable topic. Now, poltergeist activity, with, from my perspective, what I have found them is the number one form of destruction with poltergeist is fire. In every case that I've had, either electrical appliances catching fire, wiring catching fire, something, there's some type of form of fire, uh, light bulbs will pop, the smell of uh, wires burning. Uh, based on that, have there been any documented instances of like uh, light bulbs popping or the sm smell of like wires burning? Now, we, I mean, since I've owned the building, no, there hasn't been anything like that at all. 
in the in the property. We've never had anything like that. I think personally, I think it's a very safe building to investigate. Mm -hmm. My grandkids go through the building all the time. They okay. actually come out and play every once in a while. We run kids days. We've been doing that since 2016. We have kids days twice a year, and then we've been doing a teen night the last couple of years or last year or so. And if I didn't think it was safe to bring kids out here, we wouldn't do it. Fair enough. And but I don't I don't see anything negative. I mean, I've always kind of thought that however you were in your in the your regular life, your, your real life, yeah. is the same probably going to be in the afterlife. So if you were a kind of a crotchety old guy in the you know in your normal life. By the way, you're going to be in the afterlife, and some people construe that as being demonic or something, and it's not. They're just a pain in the butt, to be honest with you, is what they are. So, and uh, but yeah, and, and we've got some of that at times where somebody gets a little bit, you know, cantankerous, so to speak. Maybe a spirit might be, but I think that's just the way they were in regular life. Now, of course, now we know there's been a lot of investigations at Ashmore. Can you tell us a little bit of of the? the television shows uh, that have been to Ashmore and what they captured, anything that, that makes you like, wow, that is pretty cool. Well, there was, there's been basically four ghost adventures, uh, ghost hunters and destination fear. And then Jack Osborne. Yep. Um, I think the ghost adventures episode that was there, I think a lot of that there was, was completely negative, completely yeah. wrong. Yep. It had, it wasn't factual and I've got, I found proof to that. So I think I touch on that one. Ghost Hunters, when they were out here, that they came out a year or so after Ghost Adventures. And I think they were out here. They basically said there's nothing in the building. Um, this is after Grant was gone, but Jason had mentioned that there's nothing in the building. We don't think it's haunted at all. I think that was kind of be, trying to be a negative force. There was, Ghost Adventures and Ghost Hunters at that time were bumping heads. And I think that's what they were trying to do. Destination Fear, but they were out here, and then actually they were out here in 2015 before they ever had the TV show, and they had some cool stuff going on, and had some experiences and all. Well, then they decided to come back, and they were out here. This was actually the last place they shot their last year that they had their their season four. The last the last place they shot, they started here and they wanted to end here, and they had they caught whistling upstairs that the that Tanner heard with his own ears. And we've actually caught that in the building ourselves. And in fact, I haven't personally myself heard that whistling. And it's not just a whistle like the wind blowing through a window. It's somebody whistling a tune. And oh. we heard that thing. And they had a lot of other experiences as well. Jack Osborne, when he was out here, they had some names. Basically, his name and Jason knew, uh, Jason Kennedy and me. Jamie Kennedy. Jamie Kennedy, his name came across the spirit box. And they had a lot of personal experiences. They also brought cadaver dogs out here. And they found uh, the cadaver dogs, all three hit on a particular area on the property where they said there was a body buried. And those mm. cadaver dogs, I gave them the name of the people. So it wasn't like it was a plant that they brought out here and just said, hey, go out here and tell them this is where the dogs hit. And that wasn't the case. They didn't even know these people when they came out here. I gave them the name. They called it. They came up and they did their thing. And uh, it, it took a while. I know you've been involved with some of the shows and all. I mean, you were involved like with the Booth Brothers when you came out here, maybe. And some of the, I mean, the shows, you're, they're cut down to like 42 minutes to an hour show. So they have to cram everything in. And it, you don't see everything that happened. You just see, you know, the highlights of what happened while they're out here investigating for those two or three days. Yeah. And of course, you know, that's, uh, there's been a lot. There's been a lot. So besides the whistling, what else has been captured in your in your perspective oh i mean voices all the time we hear a lot of people but disembodied voices you hear that you know quite a bit quite often uh shadows are huge in here i mean we get i've had people that have sat there <clears throat> and just in chairs at the end of the hallway just watch shadow figures crossing the hallways and uh wow. just sitting there just you know, almost like they were having you know basically some of them were they were sitting there eating popcorn and potato chips watching shadow figures it was like it was a show and uh, and I had a one of the girls that helps me out here. They chased a shadow figure through the entire building for five hours one night, until they finally said, "We got to go to bed. The sun's coming up outside." And uh, so it was like the shadow was playing games with them, chasing. You know, they were chasing all over the building, and the shadows going around room by room, different places everywhere. Yeah, and of course. Uh, for those of you who, uh, if you if you Google uh, Ashmore Estates, uh, there's a lot of really cool pictures uh, that are online. And uh, you might want to you might want to try that if you've not uh, if you've not done that really really uh, some amazing shots. So I 
in your perspective, because a lot of people will ask me about shadow people, and there's a lot of theories uh, on what they are. So how would you define a shadow person from your perspective? I think that's basically the energy from, from a spirit that's in the building that may not be able to manifest completely, but it's, it, it's able to manifest enough that you can tell it's a, a person. Uh, we just saw one a couple weeks ago when uh, we were doing the Some Call at Home event out here. Another guy and I were standing down there on the first floor, and I looked down in the hallway, and I said, are you seeing that? And he's like, that shadow on the floor? I'm like, yeah, it's moving. And there was nobody down here except us. And we walked down and we, we, we were able to recreate that shadow by walking up the boiler room steps. Like the, somebody just walked out of the boiler room and just kept on moving. And wow. so we can make that shadow that way. So I think it's basically just somebody just cannot, you know, it's a spirit that just can't, they just can't form a complete body figure, but they can, they can get enough energy that they can, they can turn themselves to basically look like a shadow. You know, when you have a lot of, uh, when you have a haunted location, especially in the local area, there's always local legends and folklore about that particular haunted, you know, location. So are there any local legends or folklore surrounding Ashmore in the, uh, in the area? Well, they've, they've talked before about, a preacher that jumped out a window committed suicide. Oh. Never found anything about it. That was supposed to happen in the seventies. If that happened, there had been stories out there. It's not there. So we just, yeah. you know, we just kind of walk away from it. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't even talk about any of that type of thing. If, mm -hmm. if we can't prove it, it didn't happen as far as we're concerned, because I think as a venue owner, I want to keep it as honest to people as you most possibly can. Sure. I mean, you're always going to have people that are going to come out here and say, we talked to so-and-so or so. I'm like, I have no idea if that person's in the building. They could be. There was 200 deaths in the building. So, you know, there's a lot of names that pop up that uh, I don't always have. We don't have records for. Um, I One of my favorite ones, though, was a, a, a couple was down in the, uh, they were down in the boiler room. And they came out and asked uh, Terry, and I want to say it was James Green. She's like, do you know anything? She's like, we were asking on our spirit box, and we got James Green, first and last name, which is kind of unusual in most cases. You only usually get a first. And they said, do you know a, a James Green that died here? And they're like, no. Well, I, they went back and Googled it, and I may be wrong with the James Green. So if somebody Googles that, it, it may be the wrong name. But they Googled the name that they got, and they found the obituary where the gentleman died here at the uh, Coles County Poor Farm. Wow. And uh, yeah, because they pulled it up, they did an obituary for Ashmore, Illinois, and it pulled it up and said he did die in the Poor Farm. So that was pretty cool <laughs> when they got that across the spirit box and they were able to confirm that he did die here. So yeah, th this is a spirit box. Like So the folks, those that you know, it, that's, a, that's a tool that you can use and that came through on the spirit box and that's pretty interesting. Now, are, when uh, when people visit Ashmore Estates on their own, are are the are there guided tours or allow are they just allowed to walk all around on their own? How does that work? We kind of do it both ways. We take a uh, we'll have when we do the investigations like the one that's going to start over here in the building in a few minutes. Ashley or whoever is here, Terry, Abby, you know Holly, whoever, will take them through a tour of the building and give them the history. <clears throat> we never really give them the paranormal side of things unless they ask for it because I don't want to put something in somebody's head that that's going to happen because a lot of times right. they will just because they think it's going to happen. So we usually just give them the history of the location and let them know about that and then kind of like let them, they're on their own after that. Or you know, we do two hour tours, we'll do the same thing. We'll, we'll take them through for like a 30 minute history and then just kind of turn them loose. Or if somebody comes in and says, I don't want to know anything, just tell me where I can't go. Mm -hmm. And we'll do that as well. So it's kind of, it's, they basically, it's their night. However they want to handle it, that's what we do. Now, did you have to go since they're, you're you're about to do a tour or? or no, I don't have to. Okay, okay. Somebody else is doing it. Okay, excellent. So uh, now what about, the, uh, have there been any reports at all from people investigating where they've experienced uh, physical sensations being touched or, you know, being um, the hair being pulled, anything like that at all? Yep. In fact, what I like to do when I'm out here is, and I'll probably go, the, <coughs> excuse me, well, I'll go over here tonight and sit outside a little bit. And I always tell them, like, when you, if you have any experiences in the building, come outside, tell me what your experience was, but don't tell me where you were. Let mm -hmm. me see if I can tell you where I think you were. And which amazes a lot of people because they'll come outside and tell me that they had their hair pulled or they, they had uh, the, uh, one of the best ones is that somebody feel a, a, a rapid heart rate their heart rate changes. All of a sudden, this heart starts speeding up. And I'd be able to confirm, usually, 
you know, where they're at in the building when that happens, which I think kind of helps them because then they feel that, you know, I've confirmed exactly what the experience that they had because others had that same experience sure. in, the, in that same, same area or same location that they had it. Now, what about the local community? I know there, there are some people that uh, may not be uh, on board, perhaps in the, the local residents, have, knowing that they have a, a haunted location that's, that's known. Uh, so how, how does the community in Ashmore handle uh, having, of course, you know, Ashmore States known, being known to be haunted? Well, when I bought the place 10 years ago, I, I faced a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, I faced some negativity. Okay. A lot of it, though, was because the building looked like hell. Mm. I mean, it was just bad shape. The grass was three feet high and everything. So, in fact, I had one farmer came over, and the uh, the first weekend I bought it, he came over and said, you need to get that metal out of my field. I'm like, I just bought it yesterday. I guarantee you that stuff will be on by the end of the weekend. And he's like, yeah, I've heard that before. Wow. And a year later, he drives in the driveway, and uh, he comes out. He's like, people at Ashmore are talking. And I'm like, I don't know that that's good. And he's like, no, they can't believe how nice this place looks compared to what oh, it has nice. over the last few years. So I think that they looked at it before, and now they look at it, and it's totally different. I mean, it's 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 no longer the eyesore in Ashmore, Illinois. Sure, it's you know it's cleaned up. It looks nice. It's you know I mean we've had the the uh, the, the town from Ashmore comes down. Um, we do a, usually try to do one or two um, tours a year, just free tours, basically just kind of an open house. And we ask people just to bring in uh, food pantry items or you know hygiene items, and we donate it to the Ashmore, Illinois their uh, their food pantry. So I figured, you know, it's a poor farm. Let's collect goods from people that need help, and we take them down the uh, the poor or the the food pantry and donate to, uh, down there each year. And a lot of people came through. It's like, you know, I've always wanted to come to this building, but I never wanted to come into it the way it looked. And since we've cleaned it up, they've came through a lot more than they ever did before. So let me ask you this: I, I, you know, I've I've talked to a lot of people who have ownership or who have owned uh, haunted locations. And they've dealt with a lot of paranormal investigators and individuals, perhaps maybe even celebrities who go to the location and they do a lot of provocation. They do a lot of things that they should not do uh, to hopefully get that demonic activity. Has that uh, has that happened there at Dashmore? No, I, I mean, I've had the. I've had one gentleman that came in and, uh, in fact, I mean, I don't think he really provokes Brad Kling, who was on TV show called Ghost Lab. Brad came in and, and he was calling out the one spirit in the boiler rooms that supposedly um, picked up one guy, threw him across the room. And he was trying to call him out. It's like, hey, you want to fight with somebody or you want to pick on somebody, pick on me. And if you don't know Brad, which I think you, yeah, I think you probably do. I do. Brad's like, Six five, three hundred pounds, oh. and uh, yeah. So he he didn't have any experiences like that picked him up through him, but he actually had an experience that the temperature in the room dropped about twenty five degrees that day. Wow! While he was down there, so. But we don't really we don't have anybody who comes in and really does a lot of provoking. Um, we ask them not to. Good. I mean, I can't. I don't know what they're doing when they when we walk away, but we've just asked them not to, and and we kind of tell the people in the building, you know, the spirits in the building. They're going to provoke. Just walk away from them. And it's like, right. just leave, just don't even be there. So it, I think that kind of slows it down, too. Do you have any artifacts at Ashmore that are believed to be uh, cursed or even haunted? Um, not at Ashmore. We, we, we actually have the, the bed upstairs. We've had some people that have had some experiences with it. And uh, they've sat on that bed. They've had uh, the infected when Jack Osborne group was out here. Mm-hmm. Jimmy uh, Muse had an experience when he laid down. He just felt like he felt when he got up, it's like vertigo. He's like, you know, just felt really dizzy and all from, you know, laying on the bed. But that was probably the only thing. That's the only piece of furniture we have that's from the original poor farm or, on, or from the uh, hospital. That's it. Everything, everything else has been brought in. So, uh, do you, th has there, have there, let me ask you, has there ever been any like a controlled study or, uh, it, something where, where people can present to you, even though you've already had your experience, where perhaps an investigator shows uh, some type of investigation and saying, okay, there is a, either a picture of a full body apparition, an EVP, which stands for electronic voice phenomenon, for those of you who don't know, has there any, been any type of evidence presented to you that when you present to this public, you can say, look, 
this you're not going to be able to just toss away and say, oh, that's nothing. That that's this is a legitimate, legitimate evidence. Has it, it like the holy grail of evidence, if you will, has there ever been anything captured that would blow anyone away? Probably the one here actually that's kind of a two part. First, I don't when I get a lot of people that send me photos and EVPs and things like that. I was not there when they did it, so I can't honestly say that what they send me is legit. Fair. And in today's yeah. world, I think there's people who would love to send you something and you say, yeah, that's that's great. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's perfect. And they're like, we fake that. Right. And so right, we know right. this guy's probably allowing fake stuff to happen. Yep. So I, unless I can actually prove it myself, but I did have a group that was out here years ago and they had a, uh, they had a balloon tied to a chair upstairs and at about six, it was about six forty in the morning. The one girl told me that she felt something touch her shoulder. She was in one of the bunkhouses we had, and she felt somebody touch her shoulder like three times, like trying to get her attention. Well, when they went home and we looked at their evidence and everything, they had at about six thirty in the morning. You could see the strings on this balloon. It was a helium balloon, mm -hmm. and you could see them come unraveled and start floating up to the ceiling. And I mean, there's the strings hanging straight down. But something wow. untied that string from the chair and let it you know, let it uh, go to the ceiling. That is so, very cool. Uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. And there was nobody there. I you know I, I saw the video, and they they had they were in bed when it happened. So because wow. I was out there at the building, and I was out there when that balloon went up, but I was outside the parking lot. I hadn't gone inside the building yet. And it was, but yeah, I know that 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 was not fake. They had nothing to do with that one at all. Um, there's a lot of people have the experiences that that I talk about and I trust them, but getting something that's sent to me, a picture or a video, I'm kind of apprehensive about sharing it out there. No, I understand that. That that's that, that's very valid, very very valid. So let me. What about the uh, how do ghost stories and, and uh, perhaps maybe urban legends? Has there anything there with um, hidden passageways or secret rooms at, at Ashmore? There's no rooms like that here. We've, we've had people talking before about, uh, you know, that they had something like that. And uh, so they, you know, that they thought there was some hidden hidden area or something like that, some mine shaft thing or something. And we're like, there's nothing like that out here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we've never found anything. I've been out here for 10 years, gone through this building head to toe. And, uh, yeah, I know there's nothing nothing like that whatsoever out here. And do you, do you know, has there ever been the minor rite of exorcism performed on the location by anyone because of the alleged alleged uh, demonic activity? Nothing that I know of in the last 10 years. I do know that there supposedly was some satanic worshipers oh, wow. oh, back in when the place was closed down. And when it was abandoned and it was sitting out here, you know, I mean, you always get that, you know, those people that come in like that and they're probably doing things with, you know, that they probably shouldn't be. And so supposedly there was stuff like that. I don't know that that's true. I've never found anything on it. I've never read anything. I've gone through newspapers um, from back when the building was built forward and never came up across with anything where they were uh, uh, arrested or anything for trespassing. But, uh, but yeah, I've heard stories like that. And of course, for those of you who are just joining us, uh, I encourage you to go to Ashmore Estates website. It's ashmoreestates.net. Pretty simple, ashmoreestates.net. And when do you have the uh, the investigations, the tours? How does that work? Right now, we've got we've got our public investigation set up. The ones in April and May are sold out, but we do have some coming up after that um, in June, July, August, and all that. Uh, we've got public investigations where we only allow 12 people. We sell 12 tickets, and that's it, wow. you know, in the building. And we wanted to keep the number fairly small. They can stay out here from 7 o'clock until 2 a.m., or they can purchase an extended ticket where four of them can stay up until 10 a.m. So they can be in the building basically for 15 hours if they wanted to. And we do that. We've got, we don't have tours scheduled yet, but we will in October. We'll have some then. And then we'll also have some throughout the year when we get a chance to get them all scheduled. We do private tours anytime somebody wants to pretty much. So I just get a hold of us and we can set that up. Um, same thing with investigations. We do private 
nighttime or daytime investigations. Um, our Saturday nights and, and a lot of our Friday nights are booked. Saturday nights are all booked up until November 30th. And Friday nights, we've got some that are coming up in July and August that are still available. But we do things pretty much like seven days a week if possible. Now, what about the uh, the animal shelter benefit? What is, what is, can you tell? Because I, I was looking at your calendar and I clicked on it, the animal shelter benefit. Uh, what is that about? Yeah, Christy Ayers contacted me. She was going to do a benefit for somebody. Mm -hmm. And then they contacted her and said, hey, we've uh, we've got things taken care of. We don't need the assistance now. So she asked me if I, if I had a problem with turning over to uh, setting up for Coles County for their uh, for their pound, you know, the animal shelter there. And I was like, no, that's not a problem. So the money is collected from that. And those tours there, that's, I mean, that's coming up in a couple weeks mm -hmm. or uh, next weekend. Yeah, next Saturday. So that'd be a good time to come out. You can do it. It's going to be, a, I think they're a couple hours long. I don't remember exactly everything she's doing because I pretty much like told her the building's yours. I'll donate it to you. You wow. can do that and get it taken care of. But I think it's like $20 or something like that. And you come out for a couple hours and they'll do a tour of the building and then like a mini investigation too. So it's a good time to, to see the building during the day. Uh, which I think, I mean, you could have as much experience as here during the day as you would at night. Yeah, of course. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it, it, it's a, uh, yeah, I, and I think that that's wonderful. And you guys are on Central or Eastern time? We're Central time. So that's uh, 12 p.m. Uh, Central uh, time. And yep, the, it's $20. And of course, the, it benefits, uh, you know, the Coase County Animal Shelter. And I think that is fantastic. So if you've not been to Ashmore Estates, and you want to go check it out, and you want to also, you're a supporter of uh, the our, our fur babies, and you want to help out, well, this will be a great opportunity for you to, to go there. Uh, that event, yep, it will be there on the 20th. So the 19th, I'll be there uh, for an investigation, and then the 20th is when the animal shelter event is taking place as well. But you got to go to Ashmore Estates, Ashmore Estates, thank you very much, Ellie, ashmoreestates.net, ashmoreestates.net. Buddy, I want to thank you so much for, for chatting with us, and uh, I really do look forward. I really look forward to uh, to you know hopping on over there next Friday if everything works uh, and we are ready to push forward. And uh, I think it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, oh yeah, it'll be great. Fact, I've already got us. Uh, we're gonna, we're it's a go. Oh, good. Actually, well, the reason I say it may perhaps we were talking earlier about uh, perhaps you know some scheduling issues, but everything is good. So rock and roll. I will. Then it's locked in, locked, sealed, and. I will be there on um, next Friday, next Friday, live. So I'm looking for it. Thank you so much for chatting with us, man. I appreciate it so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for asking me on. All right, you have a great day, and I'll see you next week. Sounds good. All see right, you buddy. then. All right, buddy. All right, bye-bye. Okay, everybody, that was uh, Robin. Uh, Robin Terry. Uh, that's his name, Robin Terry from Ashmore Estates, uh, who owns who owns the building. He and his wife, uh, Robin and Norma. So uh, I'll be there. So here's the deal. For those of you who don't know, uh, next week, uh, I will be live at Ashmore Estates. And we'll be doing the show right there. So I'll be uh, on Facebook, uh, YouTube, on Rumble, KGREDB Radio, on Spreaker. We'll be live on Twitter. We'll be live on TikTok. We'll be live on all of our formats. We're going to be live and the goal ultimately is uh, for me basically to have what's called a like a base, if you will, a or a base camp, a setup camp. And then we, we set this location. And the idea, the, the, the goal is for investigators because there I think there's going to be about 50 people there. So it's going to be there are plenty of people. They're going to investigate. Hopefully they'll come on air. They'll talk to you guys about uh, what they what they saw, what they experienced. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're really, really looking forward to it. And uh, I am, uh, I'm looking forward to it as well. So there we go. It's next week, next Friday. Remember, uh, thank you. Thank you, Clif uh, Clifton. Thank you. Remember next Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget. Don't forget. Not for sure, Joseph. Not for sure. Okay. So 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be live. So we're going to be rock and roll. And if, by the way, if you want... Uh, to go and you're interested in uh, getting the tickets, then you need to go to the website, the urban investigator.com or the, yep. You, you can go, but you you know, you have to go to the website to order tickets. Uh, the urban investigator.com. I'm not getting paid. So I'm not, I'm not getting paid for this event. Uh, I'm they're, they're just, they've asked me if I would like to join 
and do the show live there? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think they'd be fantastic. So thank you, for, of course, Judy Ann, for helping me get there. That'd be, that's wonderful. Uh, well, if the, if he wants me to, uh, Jeannie. So the, uh, the, uh, the urban investigator.com. Okay. The urban investigator.com click on events. Scroll down to where it says book. Now, now if you, if you really want to go, you really need to make sure you get your tickets uh, because if they sell out, they sell out. They can only sell a certain amount of tickets and that's it. That's all. So I have no idea how many tickets that they've sold. I don't know. I don't know, but uh, I'm just letting you guys know now that apparently they have a few more tickets left from my knowledge. And uh, so there you go. So the, uh, the urban investigator.com. Thank you there, uh, Bill. So, Oh, how can we help uh, get? Oh, oh, Judy and Judy and help me. So, I, so we're uh, we're good to go, and I'll be heading over there. It's a it's about, from my understanding, maybe about four or five hour drive. Uh, a little bit longer than I thought, uh, but that's okay. That's okay. So I, I I'm going to get there. I think I think it's uh, Judy and I believe it's a day before, isn't that right? I believe I'll be getting there Thursday to uh, to set everything up. Because I don't want to drive five hours to get there and then try to set everything up that day. That would be just too much. That That's too much. And uh, so I think I'll be getting there, I think, on Thursday. And then, okay, good. Yeah, Judy Ann said yes. So I'll, I'll get there on Thursday, set everything up at the hotel, chill, relax, and then Friday show up. And Because it's a, it's, a it's a lot to take over. As a matter of fact, I just uh, checked the laptop to make sure that laptop is running on StreamYard, which it is. So uh, we have it. We have it. There we go. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Do, do the show. Do the show. Back on the X. Good, 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 good. Okay. I'm not a big fan of tarot. Yep. Uh, Braden, you absolutely will be allowed to get into heaven if you have a tattoo. Yes. And I don't know why people, uh, this, I know it has nothing to do with the paranormal, but that here's the deal. Uh, I, I'm really, I have talked about this before quite a bit, actually. There's a lot of people out there who are using the holiness code to judge other people. The holiness code is part of the old covenant. There's 613 laws in the holiness code. And they say you can't have a, you can't be Christian and have a tattoo. But, but yet they're going to judge you based on the 613 laws and they don't follow them themselves. You can't cherry pick the holiness code. That's not how it works. So if you're going to judge someone and say you have a tattoo and you're not following the holiness code and neither are they. And that's exactly why Jesus called the, the Pharisees the brood of vipers, hypocrites, because they were holding people to an account to follow 613 laws they themselves weren't following. And we're no longer, by the way, we're no longer under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. And by the way, the tattoo was talking about the image of Yahweh. It was talking about having the image of false gods. Uh, that's the whole point of that that was written for the tattoo. So again, you can't take, can't take scripture out of context, and a lot of people do. So no, no. Uh, that whole thing is just silliness. Okay, the urban investigator. Don't forget the urban investigator uh, dot com. Uh, yep, uh, that's fine. But again, folks, here here's the deal. Here, and I appreciate the I appreciate the theology questions. I appreciate that. Today is Paranormal Fridays. I'm here Sundays. I'm here Wednesdays. I'm here Fridays. I'm here Saturdays. Three days out of the week. Sometimes I'm on for three hours. You know, we can we we focus on theology, we focus on Bible study, we focus on scripture, we focus on three, I mean three hours at a time sometimes. So tonight's paranormal. That's what we do tonight. And I think that's fair. So make sure you get your tickets, the urbaninvestigator.com. Okay. And thank you very much for Robin for joining us. Hopefully you uh you enjoy it. It's really cool. Uh it is really cool to to chat with somebody and and get their perspective on things. I tell you what, get this. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's uh, when you experience the paranormal. It's for some people. Um, for some people, it's kind of scary. It's scary. So listen to this. Listen to this. This is kind of this is kind of funny. I wanted to uh, to share this with you. When I read it, I thought, oh, I got to share this with everybody. This is. And by the way, if you have questions, if you have questions uh, about demonology. Uh, paranormal you can ask you can ask them now so uh and i would be more than happy to entertain them this is from reality t well melissa gorga melissa gorga i have no idea who she is but apparently she's a celebrity okay 
uh, she she believed that the earthquake was paranormal, and she almost called 911 because she thought that there was a ghost. So the next, so this says here, again, I, by, this is by Amy DeVore. It says, Dear Melissa, the next time uh, that I am back up in New York City, can we please meet up and have a drink? After the recent earthquake that hit the Northeast, your response was so out of the box that I just want to sit and listen to what else you got to say on everything. She said, really, seriously, we don't even have to discuss the real housewives of New Jersey. Okay, I think that's what she is. So anyway, she thought that the earthquake was a ghost. So uh, as for the words on her post, these were pretty standard. As she explained that she just went running up my stairs from the basement, working out while calling 911 because it sounded like a stampede was going on upstairs. And then I got a notification on my phone that my front door was open. I was freaking out. And that was the first. She said, okay, look, uh, so, so, I mean, there's a lot, look, if I have, if I feel, uh, okay, I, I've never experienced uh, an earthquake, okay, but I, I live in Kentucky, so we are on the new Madrid fault line, so it's quite possible that we could have one, it's probable, actually, but if we start shaking, <laughs> I'm not going to think it's a ghost, that's, uh, that's not going to enter my mind. It's going to be thinking, okay, I probably need to get out of the house uh, because I don't want to come crumbling down on me. So uh, it's just, uh, you know. Uh, do you believe that people that go to the cemetery? Do I believe that people go to the cemetery for what? what I, you had to finish. Uh, so you had to help me out with that one. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand. Nonfiction, nonfiction demonology book. Okay, so someone was asking about uh, what's my favorite. Uh, not and, and and for those of you who are who are going to say you don't answer our questions or you're not answering my question, you'll be you'll be ignored. Uh, we, we don't do that here. That's gaslighting. We we don't we don't we don't do that nonsense here. I have three different computers running at the same time, which means I have three different multiple chats. One, two, three, four, five chats open right now. So I, I you know I can only do so much. So I, I have. Uh, we're not we're not going to get into the you don't answer my question things you know what we're, we're not in grade school uh, i'll get to them if i can if i can i'm sorry but listen to this i wanted to share this with you this is from tk randall well thank you i appreciate it tk randall this is this is eerie uh yeah we'll, we'll, we'll do that uh may i ask the what the criteria to say a home has a demonic attachment yeah yeah i'll, I'll do that i'll answer that in just a second just remind me A ghost hunting woman, I hate that term ghost hunting, dressed as a vampire, found deceased in an old church. So the young French woman was found deceased at an abandoned church in northern Italy's uh, Oeste, Oeste Valley a few days ago in a strange and disturbing case that perplexed local authorities. The 22-year-old was found deceased with most of the blood drained from her body uh, after being stabbed with a camping knife. Three gunshot wounds were also seemingly inflicted on her body after she had passed and someone had, for some unknown reasons, scraped some of her blood off the floor and taken it with them. And the case could potentially be connected to the mysterious disappearance of two other people in the same area. The church in which the woman was found is abandoned and has gained something of a, something of a reputation for being haunted. Now, police believe that she may have been there as part of a social media ghost hunting challenge that is currently popular in France. Witnesses reportedly saw both her and a male friend dressed up as vampires in the general area before her passing and noted that she had looked pale and emaciated like a walking corpse, that's quote. And police are also investigating the possibility that she had become involved in some form of ritualistic sacrifice or even consented unaliving uh, or that her presence at the church was part of a social media prank gone wrong. Detectives are focusing their efforts on finding the male friend who was seen with the woman as well as the owner of the uh, burgundy van that was spotted on the CCTV near the church the previous week. That is crazy. That, that, I'm going to have to uh, put this to the side and do a follow-up on that uh, because I, I tell you. Uh, yeah, I haven't forgot. I haven't forgotten. 
I, I just got to make notes of the questions. Demon, uh, a nonfiction demonology book. I always tell people, uh, Hostage to the Devil is a fantastic book. Uh, that's a very good one. So Hostage to the Devil and um, Dark Siege, darksiege.com. Uh, Jason McLeod is a friend of mine, and he uh, actually worked with the Warrens and was trained by the Warrens. I, I knew Lorraine, so I was friends with Lorraine. I did not know Ed. And uh, he actually worked and was trained by the Warrens, and he has uh, some amazing books, amazing, amazing books. And go to darksiege.com. Yep, dark seeds. I think they're Judy. Dark seeds.com. They are, oh, thank you there, John. They are fantastic. And uh, I, I'm telling you, I, I endorse, I endorse uh, the books because they are just, the way he writes is so brilliant that he actually, you feel like you're in the scene. And you're not going to want to put the books down. I can promise you that right now. Uh, I read one chapter and it was getting two o'clock in the morning. I was like, I got to read what happens next. I, mean, I got to read. It was, and it's based, it's a true story. It's a, it's a true, these are it's a true case that he worked. And I believe he's working on a third one from my understanding, or he had finished one. I'm not for sure, but I encourage you dark siege.com. Very, very good book. Yeah. How um, Malachi Martin hostage, the devil is very good as well. Um, demonic attachment. Now there's a difference, but someone was asking about demonic attachment versus demonic infestation. Please understand that demonic attachment is different from demonic infestation. So if you have demonic infestation, so for example, you go out to a paranormal location that's known to have a demonic, um, element to it. And you say, is anybody here? Can you do something? Can you make a noise? Can you push me? Can you touch me? That's invitation. The demonic is attached. You then go to your home. Now, automatically, you're going to have demonic infestation. So demonic infest infestation means the manifestations could be variety. Religious objects will be desecrated. Sometimes you'll hear the bangings of three, but not always. The smell of sulfur or, or, or rotten flesh will occur. Uh, it's that overwhelming sensation of dread. I mean, it, it is it's just overwhelming. You don't need a psychic to tell you there's a demon that's present. Now, demonic attachment is when it begins to interact with you on a physical level and then on an intellectual level. Uh, thank you there, Clinton. Uh, Cl is it Clinton, thank you. So demonic, uh, in, in, when you have a demonic attachment, and there are three stages to that leads to possession. So you have demonic infestation, which I've just talked about. Then you have demonic oppression and obsession. So that's both, but it's still one stage. So demonic uh, oppression is when it's beginning to physically attack your body, breaking you down. And it's breaking the will down. So, I'm, folks, I'm not going to answer any more questions because I'm answering a question. <laughs> People are getting mad at me sending me messages on Messenger. Why aren't you answering questions? Because I'm answering a question. People just, the, the entitlement is just ridiculous. Uh, now, now, it's just, I, oh, it drives me crazy when people do that. So, demonic attachment is it begins to oppress you physically. And demonic obsession is when it begins to attack you on an intellectual level. It's breaking down the intellect and the will. At that time, once that occurs, then possession can occur. As a matter of fact, the person who asked me on Messenger who is rude, I'm blocking you. So I'm not even going to answer a question there. We'll fix that problem right away. Um, I agree. I'd be, uh, nasty, nasty. I'm answering. When someone asks me a question and I try to answer it, that means I'm thinking and I'm not looking at other questions because that would be disrespectful. So, but anyway, uh, that's what leads to a, a possibility of possession. Possession is rare. It does occur, but it is rare. Uh, okay. You're happy to wait, but you have to ask the question again because I didn't see it. Uh, again, I have four chat rooms open right here. Four. So you got to get that. You have to ask again, and I'll try my best to 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 to, to grab it if I can see it. Um. Oh, you had a spiritual awakening. Very interesting. Yep, I agree, Leanne. As a matter of fact, again, for those of you, um, there's a few people on social media that's that on on Messenger that's kind of saying you always talk about paranormal. Actually, I don't, and I appreciate uh, the thought, uh, but 
we're here Sundays and Wednesdays and we do Bible study. I teach Bible study. And I've been teaching Revelation now for how many months? Uh, we also have night prayer Monday through Friday. So we do a lot of scripture. <laughs> so we, we do a lot of scripture. We love that. We love to have you. Um, well, yeah, salt and chalk. I mean, there, 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 there's the belief that salt, uh, the blessed salt can uh, push away or repel evil. Uh, I, I have found true, in my opinion, uh, I have found that um, that does work on some cases. But uh, when you're dealing with the demonic and you're dealing with the cases that I've worked, they've tried bless salt uh, and they've even tried the epiphany of the doors on some of the cases that I work. But they, the, the, it was so violent. You have to remember that you when you have a demonic infestation. So when you have a demonic that's present. And you do a blessing like the, the epiphany of the doors, the blessing of the doors, that can be a form of provocation. So you need to understand that. That's provoking. Now, I encourage people to, to absolutely take a stand and, and, and do the blessing of the doors. And, and absolutely, but you have to be careful with that because when you do something of this nature, that is provocation. So provocation is not beating your chest and saying, come on, I dare you to do something to me. You're not provoking, you're inviting. So those are two different things, completely two different things. But when you're there and you're and you are praying and you're using what's called sacramentals of the church, like blessed salt, uh, holy water, oil, or chalk, when you do the blessing of the doors, uh, you can have a very violent reaction. And so you have to be prepared for that. So anyway, hopefully that. Uh... Oh, that's fine. That's fine. Welcome. Welcome. Um, scary situation I, that I've seen in exit, the first one, uh, and I talked about that on the, uh, the, the, the show that I was on as a cast member. Oh, and, and by the way, uh, someone was asking about, uh, we have not at this, pl at this time, I don't believe there are plans currently for a season two. We've not been told anything about that. Uh, so the Eli Roth presents Legion of Exorcist show, uh, my, my case that I had talked about, I believe that was the first the first show on the episode, I believe uh, that was my first case. That was my first exorcism. Not my first case, my first uh, exorcism. And that was, uh, that, that was an eye opener. No pun intended. I mean, but uh, that was a very interesting, you know, you can read about it then you can study and you can be trained. And, but until you're actually there and you're, you're in the presence of a true demonic, uh, it is, um, it's a different world. It's a totally different world. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you. I appreciate you being here. Uh, this was the time where I lifted the eyelids, and the eyelids were completely solid black. The face, I mean, the eyes, were. there was nothing in there but just a total blackness. And I had read, <clears throat> I had read plenty of, of case studies where that occurred. But when you're actually, when you were there, and, you're, and, and I wasn't the bishop at the time. I was the secondary. So I wasn't the primary. I was the secondary. And so I was the assistant. But I lifted the eyelids knowing that it could be, they could be black. And when they were, it was, but I, I talked about this, but it was almost like, a, it wasn't a dull black. It was a sh like a shiny black, like a mirror. I could see my reflection in the eyes. And because of that, I, I just, I was completely froze. I couldn't think, I couldn't talk, I couldn't, I couldn't move, couldn't do anything. And uh, so, yeah, that, that, was the, that was a pretty interesting, yeah, pretty interesting experience. Anytime, you have to remember that when you have a, de if you have a demon, a demonic infestation in your home, and you begin to pray, that is a form of provocation. If I have a demonic infestation case, I will begin to pray the litany of the saints. I am forcing the entity to manifest itself. Now, I, I tell people all the time, but you can't be afraid. You can't show fear. But if you're going to do this, you have to understand that there could be a reaction. And so people need to be aware of that. But at the same time, you can't, you can't be intimidated by it. And you have to have this, you have to have the faith and realize you just keep. So if you're going to do it, you can't be timid. You have to be firm. 
stern and push forward. But at the same time, you also, I, I also tell people there, you have to know the consequences for this. Because if there is a true demon present and you're going to pray and you're going to use the a pray the epiphany of the doors, you're going to use sacramentals of the church, holy water, oil, etc. You're going to, you're, you could get a very violent response. Uh, you could get, uh, or it could be very minor and that could be it. Uh, but I, it just depends on the case. Uh, there was a, there was one time where a family did the epiphany of the doors and I talked to them about this and they were telling me, you know, it's very violent. And I said, look, I, I, I can tell you about that because they had heard about the epiphany of the doors. And I told them, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Uh, I really think you need to get clergy involved in this because the way what you're describing to me is it's very violent. The activity is very violent because this was not just a banging on the doors or the smell of sulfur or this was violent. People being bitten, scratched, hair being pulled, someone thrown off the bed. I mean, we're talking that type of violence. So, and I told them, if you do the epiphany of the doors, this could be a form of provocation and that could cause, that could amplify the activity. So I told them then, just wait, let me try to get involved. Let me try to get to your home. And then the, the minor rite of exorcism needs to be performed. But they were eager and, and they did. Uh, and they performed the epiphany of the doors. Even I told them not to do it because I didn't think it was a good idea. And they did anyway. And the father was nearly pushed down the stairs. I mean, shoved. And he hit his head on the uh, on the wall and went right down. And thankfully, he grabbed onto the um, uh, that the the railing, and because they had wooden stairs. And had he not grabbed onto that railing, and I mean, he, the terrible things could have happened. I mean, he was shoved. He said, "I mean, he was shoved hard, and he was pushed to a point where he hit the back so hard on the wall, and then he went down." And so I. This is what I'm talking about. This stuff is, see, here's the deal. The people say to, well, I don't, I, I don't believe in demons. Well, I don't care. Okay. Well, prove to me the demons exist. Sorry, the world doesn't revolve around you, sunshine. Doesn't, doesn't, roll, nope. I don't have to prove to you the demons exist. Don't have to, well, then I don't believe it. Then I don't care. <laughs> see, I, I don't have to prove anything to anybody because Christ already said demons exist. And if Christ said demons exist, then I don't need to prove anything to anybody. I'm a Christian, then you should believe what Christ told you. It was so important that he bestowed that ministry on his disciples. And so if it wasn't important, and if there are no demons, he would not have this, uh, you know, bestowed that, that ministry on his disciples. So I don't have to, I, I have learned a long time ago, and so because people kept telling me, you need to prove to me, you need to prove to me. And finally, I got frustrated with it. I said, and it just came to me. I said, you know, I, I'm not here to prove to you that demons exist. I'm here to help the families who know they do. That was it. So from now, because I, I, I got to a, I was constantly, why aren't these people understanding? Why are these people getting? But now I got to a point where I was like, okay, you know, if you don't want to believe, fine. I don't care. That that's a that you know, okay, it's your choice. Uh, but uh, I find it interesting that people say that they're a Christian, but yet they do they deny demonic activity and possession, and yet it's in scripture. And I think it is, and I think that's what it is. Um, the people have not seen it, and they're just interested. They're intrigued. Folks, uh, here's the problem. Uh, you know, you, the, the old saying, curiosity killed the cat. When you're in the presence of, of someone who's possessed, you don't want to be there. No one, I, I think only a, someone who is sadistic would want to actually be there. And here's why I say that because the person is going through extreme physical trauma. I had a person uh, that was possessed, and under possession, the, per, the demonic was looking right at me, and just the, the, it was a female, and her nails were a little, little longer. And normally we, click, we clip them uh, because they, they will scratch. And that can be very violent. But the demonic was looking right at me and just grabbed the nail and just yanked it off. And just spit it right at me. And just there was no there was no grimace. There, there was no uh, reaction to the pain. And there was nothing. It was just nothing. And that was to let me know I have control of this body, not you. And that was a form of intimidation. So things like this what can occur. 
And I don't understand the fascination with it. I don't understand the desire to want to see that. Because you're dealing with somebody who is going through severe trauma. This is not entertainment. This is why I will never perform an exorcism on camera. Never. And I never, I never have, never will. This is why I've never charged for the ministry. Never have, never will. And uh, it doesn't make it easy, but I just won't do it. And I will never, ever perform an exorcism on a human being on camera. N will never do, never, under no circumstances. And I have been, and I have been offered television jobs, nice paying, really great paying jobs, even producer title position, which even, you get even more money than just being as a, as a cast or talent, as they call it. So uh, th here's the deal. Um, people say to me all the time, well, I just don't believe. And I understand that because they haven't seen it. I get it. Totally understand it. But then I say to people, when I talk to them, do you consider me to be uh, at least a, a, a person that is, has some intelligence? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, fine. Okay, I have. And then I tell them. So, And I don't say this for, for braggadocious reasons. But I'm doing it for clarification. I have a doctorate in ministry. I have a master of divinity, a master of education, and a master of business. I don't charge for this ministry. I never, never, I have, I, I've never charged one penny going to people's homes and blessing their homes. I've never charged one penny for performing an exorcism. Never. If I did not know that exorcisms exist or possession exist, I would do something else with my time. Because I'm not doing this for fame. Because you do things for fame so that you can make money. But I don't make money off this. So there is no fame. There is no money. So the problem is, is I take those two factors out of the equation so that people can't use those against me. Because people say, well, aha, well, that's why you're doing it. Your, your intent is to make money. I don't charge. So try again. Uh, and this is, so I, I, pro, I would absolutely a million percent, I would be doing something else with my time without question if I did not know the possession existed. I'd do something else. I certainly wouldn't be, or, or if I was charging a substantial amount of money, yeah, then you could say, aha, that's why you're doing it. You're making it, you're making a great living off of it. Well, I'm not. So there it is. And yep, and that's it. That's facts. So. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, this is just, uh, please understand, I, I've been, uh, look, I, I've been dealing, dealing with haters f over 20 years. I'm very thick skin. So this is not me trying to be, trying to defend myself in any way, shape, form, or fashion. As I just said, I don't care if someone doesn't believe in demons. Okay, well then, go talk to your therapist. What do you want me to do about it? So, Okay. So there we go. Um, oh, that's a good one. You know, there's a lot of great questions uh, that I'm, I'm able to see. Is it Mackin? Uh, what is your opinion on demonic activity through AI technology? Let me tell you something. This is really fascinating. So, folks, I'm answering a question, so I can't answer another question. Isn't it terrible that I have to say that? Uh, there are cars, and I don't know what they have. I, I think they're, I don't know. I don't, I have a well, 20 year old car or whatever it is. Um, but there are, I think it's a Tesla, uh, and they have this uh, technology on the on these. I think it's a Tesla, where they're going on, they're going into graveyards, and these these Tesla machines are picking up these uh, images. Basically, I'm telling you, uh, it is interesting. It is very interesting. Absolutely, but I will tell you this. Demonic activity can manipulate anything. Technology, absolutely not a problem at all. Because many times, here's, and here's what happens. Uh, like, for example, there's a lot of apps. There's a lot of apps, paranormal apps that you can find, you can download. Demonic entities will often use children as a disguise to uh, immediately reduce your defenses, thinking that you are actually speaking to a child when in fact you're not. And so uh, they, they've done that quite a bit, especially with the Ouija board. 
Uh, they've done that through, uh, I've, I've had cases where people use you know, the technology that they have, the apps, and they think, oh, it's just, you know, speaking to a child. And then uh, they, they start, then they start bringing in these technologies in their home. And they start, it's not going to hurt. Is anybody here? Can you say something? Can you make a noise? And, and then that you're using that technology and then things start coming through. That can trigger demonic infestation just like that. But I, I just want, uh, I look, I, I want uh, you to understand a lot of people are so frightened of demons and I understand that perspective, but demonic possession is truly rare. This is not something that happens every day. So I, I would say I've been debating, there was an exorcism that I performed uh, and I would say 31 exorcisms in over 20 years. And I get thousands of requests, people thinking that they're possessed all the time. And 31 exorcism in 20 years. So this is really, possession is truly rare, but it does occur. Now, I have seen absolutely without question, there is no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I have seen an, an, an increase in demonic, um, in what's called ordinary demonic activity. Meaning that uh, the demons will uh, tempt you to do things that you that you shouldn't do. And all you got to do, folks, all you have to do is go on social media. Social media has become rife with demonic activity. I have never seen so much hatred, nastiness, evil in my entire life as I have seen lately. It has gotten unbelievably, I, I, I can't even there are no words, to, but I've seen it. It's just unbelievable. Uh, even to the point of, like I was talking about Kevin, that little kid who has a bodal, uh, um, brittle bone disease. The people were making fun of him. A little a 10-year-old kid going on TikTok. Uh, he built a little community and he, that's what keeps him going when he has a, he breaks a bone or he's in the hospital and he, he builds a, a, he's built a beautiful little community there and people were going on his live making fun of him. And then you want me to prove to me that the, you want me to prove to you that demons exist? If you can't see that that is sadistic, if you can't see that as evil, then I can't prove to you. For, I, there's nothing I can prove to you. There's nothing. Uh, it is. It is. I mean, they what they did to that kid was terrible. And even to the point where he went on to and he started crying. You know, asking people, "Why are you doing this? Why are you? Why are you?" I mean, it was terrible terrible. So I have absolutely seen a dramatic increase in evil online. It has been, it has been horrible, horrible. But you, you know, you, that's the thing. You, 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 you have to keep pushing. You have to keep pushing and push and push and push back. And that's what you got to do. So I am a demon from hell, Simon says. Well, hey, Simon, let me introduce you to Block. Bye-bye. Simon went back to hell. Anyway, that's what I'm talking about. See what I mean? Uh, that's a perfect example right there. So Simon, some guy named Simon on TikTok says, I'm a demon from hell. See, you, you just made, he just made my point. They're not very bright. I would, <laughs> they're not very bright, but that's okay. So I guess uh, Simon has been blocked. Simon. Oh boy. Yeah. Simon says, bye bye, Felicia. All right. That's, that's what Simon says. Bye bye. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. So I know that I've been answering questions. So I haven't been looking at the, the so I, I will try to pause for a moment to answer more questions that you guys have. By the way, we're going to be here tomorrow. Miss Wilma and I will be here tomorrow. Uh, I'm not leaving yet. Uh, we're we're going to be here at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, what about the Qumran and Essenes? Uh, will you be bringing, I will have my obelisks. Yeah. You know, I got to tell you, uh, the shadow people, I, I have had cases where shadow people are, were, were violent. Thank you. And where other people, uh, 
other shadow people, I, it was not violent at all. The, the jury is still out about that. It, it's just, um, there, there's, it is so across the board. It is so across the board with this because I've had cases where there were shadow people that was present that people took pictures of. You can see, you clearly see a silhouette of, uh, that was not violent and just the, just the opposite. I don't know. Yeah. We don't know. I mean, there's, there's the, the belief is the shadow people exist because of that. They're human. A lot of people believe they're human spirits. that's trying to manifest the, for a full body apparition. The, the argument is the theory is for a full body apparition takes a great deal of energy. And so to manifest that type of energy, that's why a lot of people will see that they will see shadow people. And, um, no, I, I'm never alone on an exorcism. Never. Oh, you're welcome. Never, never, never. I will always have uh, an assistant with me. And not only will I have an assistant, but I also will have uh, someone who is trained medically so that they can uh, monitor the vitals. Yeah, a lot of people are asking me about it. And I, I kind of talked about that in the very beginning. And I know that some people might just be tuning in. There's a lot of people out there that, that give uh, paranormal investigators a hard time. And I, that really bothers me. It gets under, it really gets under my, it just gets under my skin. There are so many people that love to judge, but you know what? They're on the sidelines. They're never helping. They're, ne they're never helping. They don't ever help. So when a family calls me and says, look, I really need help. I'm terrified. There's something in my home and I need help. Well, I, and I've talked about this earlier. I will call paranormal teams that I know that are credible, that don't think everything is a demonic, and they go to people's homes. They don't charge. They're buying the equipment. They're spending hours and hours at a home and a person's house. They don't owe them anything at all, nothing. But they're giving these people their time, their effort, their energy to try to find out what's going on. They present the evidence to me, and then we go from there. And I really am getting sick and tired of people judging paranormal investigators who do this and say they're doing the work of the devil. But the paranormal investigators are the one answering the phone calls at two or three or four o'clock in the morning. The paranormal investigators are the ones packing up all the all the equipment in the car, traveling hours to people's homes, whom, again, they don't owe them nothing. The paranormal investigators are the ones that's buying all the equipment. But the people who are bitching about it and complaining about it and judging them, they're doing nothing nothing to help the families who go through the activity. They're doing nothing, but they're offering one thing that they only do is criticize. Oh, they'll offer a criticism because it's free. It doesn't require any work. It doesn't require any dedication. And they'll criticize, but they won't offer to help. See, that's hypocrisy. So this is why I, I absolutely firmly support Paranormal investigators who, who do not charge, who don't think everything is a demon, who are respectful. I, I work with paranormal investigators who are, who are doctors, who are attorneys, who are police officers for all across all of, I mean, from all, you know, spectrums of life. And they go into these people's homes, they investigate, they, again, they buy the equipment from their own pocketbook. And I need that because I can't be everywhere at once. I can't be in California one day and Florida the next in Texas. I can't because I don't charge. So this is why I depend on paranormal investigators and they do this and they go to these people's homes and they help. But yet people are going to sit there and judge them and don't offer one, not one thing, but criticism, but criticism. So, you know, it's, uh, well, the problem is I, I, we have good teams. We have great teams. Uh, but I mean, if I have a team, you know, it's in, that's in Kentucky and there's a family that needs help in California, well, we got a network. So we have teams that are really reputable in California or Florida or Texas or wherever, and they could go and they can investigate They gather all the evidence. Cause it takes a long time. If you're a paranormal investigator, you know how much time it takes to put all that stuff together. And then you gather and you present it to the to uh, look at it and, and I determine wh what we need to do from there. But I'm just getting sick and tired. I'm really getting fed up with people who call themselves Christians and they sit and judge paranormal investigators and call them all kinds of names, but their real name. And yet they're on the sidelines bitching about everything and not doing one thing to help. Never, never one time do they lift a finger to help. Not one time, but they'll offer criticism. 
Bye. Those people I have no patience with. None, none at all. So, yeah, I, I don't ever think that's a good idea, uh, user 504. Anytime you start challenging things of this nature because you don't know what you're challenging and you shouldn't be doing it anyway, uh, that that is really dangerous. Uh, no, Katrina. Katrina is asking, is there ever a time where you stopped an exorcism because the victim might perish? Thankfully, no. But there was a time that we had to stop to let the person, um, let the body relax because there was violent regurgitation, which does occur during an exorcism or, or can occur. So. Yeah, and so you know we have to be we have to be careful about that. Was it scary? Uh, was it scary to investigate on ghost adventures? Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't scary. I was just contr I was worried about Zach, and not only Zach, but I was also worried about Aaron. Uh, because there was one time when we were in the back and we were at the well, and I was doing the blessing. And then I, but I, I, before we went there, I told him, I said, guys, stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. Don't, don't wander off because you're going to hear growls. You're going to hear this. You're, these are going to happen. And, and uh, of course, I'm friends with Zach and, and uh, Zach, he, he, you know, he owns investigate, apparently, look, he owns Ghost Adventures. It's his job to document. And he heard a growl and he went right towards it. I understand the temptation to do that. But when he came back, he was, there was something different in his eyes. And I knew then, oh boy, we got a problem. So we went to the back where we heard the growl. And then Aaron kept looking. And I, I was noticing when I was doing the, the, the blessing, Aaron kept looking over like he was he had the eye thing, or whatever you call it, on the thing, on the video come. It was just them. They didn't have a huge uh, staff. It was just them at that time. And he kept looking over me and just giving me this, na I mean, just evil look. I did it like three or four times. I mean, it was really evil. And uh, I remember walking past him and he just kind of nudged him, nudged me with my, with his shoulders. And that's very, un, that's not normal for Aaron because Aaron is a, is a sweet, he is a really, very kind person, really, really kind hearted person. But that's when, uh, yeah, that's when we had some problems. So. Uh, no, actually, that's a good question. Would sedating the victim help in an exorcism? No, there, there were actually, there was a time where um, the individual already had anxiety medicine. So we can't sedate them legally because it's actually, unless it's prescribed by a doctor, so it's against the law. Uh, but if the person has anxiety medicine, uh, many times, uh, if the person is under the stage of possession, the demonic will not allow that. So if you try to, okay, you know, if you, you can't force it. So if you try to give the, the uh, like a calming mechanism down, uh, the, the person doesn't have control of the body. So the demonic many times will just spit it at and spit it in your face uh, or, or laugh or mock you. Uh, there was a, there was a, I forgot the, um, there was one medicine that I can't remember what it was. It starts with a D. I don't, I, I can't, I'm not a doctor, but it's a very strong tranquilizer. And uh, the person had this for, prescri for you know, prescription and there, there was some issues with, uh, the anxiety. There were some things going on before the person went into possession, into transient possession. And she said, I, I need my medicine. I need my medicine. And I can't remember what's called a D. And so she gave it, we gave it to the, the person and it, she, she even told us this should knock me out. This should knock. It could, it could be diazepam. That sounds familiar. I think it was diazepam. That sounds familiar. Uh, it was, a, it was a strong, like a knock me out kind of a medicine. And so she took it. And so we calmed her down. She started calming down. And there's two types of possession. There's perfect possession where the body, where the demonic has full possession of the body. Goodness gracious is already uh, where it has full, okay. Where it's full possession of the body and there's transient possession where the demonic will enter the body and leave it will. So she suffered from transient possession. And what I have to do is to, to force the entity to manifest through provocation. So I do this through the litany of the uh, saints, prayer, et cetera. And so she had taken it and it was about 15 minutes and you can kind of see the body just kind of mellow and you can kind of see just, and then I began the litany of the saints, her eyes opened up and there was this blackness to us, but she still had whites. She said it's kind of like a white in her eyes and she looked right at me and I'll never forget what the, the demon says, uh, that drug, whatever it was, that, that diazepam, give me another. As a form of mocking, 
saying that if you think this is going to work, watch what I what, give me another. And we didn't do it. Of course, we, we didn't give it up. And it started, to, it started smirking. And then the person went right into transient possession. So, yeah, it was. Uh, but yeah, I think it was diazepam. All right. Uh, for those of you are. So stick with me on TikTok. I'm not going anywhere. For those of you who are on uh, Spreaker, I'm going to say good night to you guys. Gosh, I can't believe it's already gone. It's already got a closed shop. I want to remind everybody that next week, don't forget, folks, next week, we're going to be live at Ashmore Estates. But it's at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So do not forget, 7 p.m. For those of you on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Rumble, KGRADB, and everyone else, remember I tell you your value does not decrease based on someone's inability or refusal to see your worth. You're priceless, and don't let anybody tell you or convince you otherwise. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, KGRADB Radio, and Rumble, good night. The Sacred Division has been brought to you by Bishop Long's online paranormal course, Learn Demonology, Angelology, Paranormal Studies, and Genealogy. It's 100% online, and you learn at your own pace. Please go to www.bishopjameslong.com and click on the Paranormal Course link.